right, folks. Um, let's see. If um, if you weren't here last week and you haven't yet signed the roster, please do so or put your name next or check mark next to your name. Um, if you weren't here last week, we. Uh, all we did was go over the syllabus, so you really didn't miss much. Um, today we are going to, or I'm going to give you kind of an overview of uh, cognitive psych. Uh, again, many of you have already had a class in cognitive psych. Some of you haven't, um, but the overview will be helpful nonetheless. Uh, we'll also continue to work on this uh, little test here that I gave you last week um, to see how you're doing there. Um, one kind of really important update, um, one of your cohorts has graciously allowed me to record my lectures and what will happen then is uh, they will be put up on uh, YouTube. Um, there won't be anything like me dancing or telling jokes or anything like that, but it'll be the, the auditory version of, of whatever comes out of these class sessions. So I did this a year ago, and it worked out actually quite well. So if there are times you're not here, um, you can always listen to the lectures up on uh, uh, YouTube, uh, and then I will cut and paste those into the Blackboard uh, course. So uh, Now that doesn't mean don't take notes or any of that stuff, but just know that uh, all of this is being recorded. If you also want to record them, go ahead. doesn't matter. Um, whatever works. All right. Um, we did go over the syllabus last week, but I always start my classes off by asking if anybody has any questions. Any questions? Any questions? Beth, you have your own desk. That's great. Okay. Every other week, somebody else will get to sit in the desk so that everybody gets equal desk time. Um, any questions? Okay. It sounds like there are none, which can be good or bad. Remember, though, starting next week, you will start to submit uh, your uh, weekly uh, research updates. So um, if you're having some issues with those, please let me know, and I can help you with those. Um, all right, so overview of cognitive psych. Let's see, how can we start this off? Now, like I said, some of this will serve as a review for some of you. Some of this will be the first time uh, you've seen this stuff, and that's certainly okay. Uh, I want to give you kind of a background uh, as much as possible into what we're going to talk about. Um, and I will supplement it with uh, some of the work I've done in cognitive psych over the last three decades, so um, there's lots of stuff we will, we will talk about in here. Um, this intro just kind of serves as a, a general overview. I mean, I can't obviously talk about everything in cognitive psych, and actually every week I will also start off each uh, part of the book with an overview as well, so I think next week we uh, are into the pattern recognition part of the book, and I'll give you a little bit of an overview on uh, pattern recognition as well, and then every subsequent uh, section or part or whatever the textbook calls them. So there'll always be kind of an overview as well. Again, that overview won't be in the book because the book already assumes 
that you know this stuff, but that's how we'll do this. This overview, basically, what I want to talk about is the whole notion of information processing. And last week I talked a little bit about how uh, a quarter of a second, which isn't a lot of time, uh, is actually ample time for a lot of what we're going to talk about in here. Um, I think the example I used last week was uh, word recognition. You know, how long does it take you to recognize a word? You know, if I present it to you visually, auditorily, uh, tactily, if you're blind, uh, I can present it to you any number of ways, and uh, that uh, magic number, quarter of a second, or thereabouts is, is pretty typical of this. Um, so when we necessarily talk about information processing, uh, obviously time is pretty critical. Uh, in most cognitive experiments, and I know some of you have done them, some of you have been in my cognitive experiments, uh, you're always told respond as quickly and as accurately as you can. So time is often critical. Uh, we want to make sure you're responding as fast as you can. Although we know and you know that subjects make mistakes, subjects are looking off into the distance instead of looking at the screen or the monitor or whatever. But we always emphasize uh, speed and also accuracy because we never want to have uh, a SATO. SATO is a speed accuracy trade-off. Uh, those are real killers, as it were. Uh, you could have very nice data, and you could uh, analyze your uh, reaction time, which most people do in a separate analysis, and then you do a separate analysis on error rates, or alternatively, percent correct. And you may come to find out that you have a speed accuracy trade-off. Uh, those are difficult to overcome. Uh, you can be kind of sneaky. Uh, what does he mean by that? Well, in uh, reaction time, it's possible to trim the data. And trimming the data is not a bad thing, especially when you're working with reaction time. Um, and I think you're all familiar with what an outlier is. Um, there are many ways to get at this, and this will come up repeatedly in the class, especially those articles that use response time or reaction time as the dependent measure. Uh, and there's a huge debate still in the cognitive literature about what is an appropriate outlier. Um, when I was in grad school a long, long time ago, my advisor made everybody in the lab do analyses pretty much the same way. We did an overall analysis where we didn't toss any data out uh, based on uh, a, a large error rate. So let's say you're doing a reaction time experiment and you emphasize speed and accuracy, unless you're varying those as independent variables. Uh, most people should be 90% or better in uh, response time, word recognition kinds of studies. Now, of course, if you study a special group, you know, autistic individuals, old people, uh, whatever, you may lower your percent correct. And maybe you say, let's go with 75%. Uh, but typically, you set a priori a kind of percent that you're looking for, and you may toss subjects based on those that make too many mistakes. You never toss them if they don't make mistakes, but if they make a lot of errors, maybe they didn't bring their glasses that day, maybe they were looking off into the distance instead of looking at the screen, and they make a lot of mistakes, you can uh, justifiably toss them out and you often replace them with another subject who doesn't commit 
as many mistakes. But another way around that is to do an outlier analysis where you may look at your reaction time and toss out any response times that are greater or less than one standard deviation away from the mean. And that's one quick and dirty way to see what your data look like. Uh, some people go to uh, two or more standard deviations. Some people have gone as large as three standard deviations. And anything that falls out, either a really fast response or a really slow response, you can justifiably toss them out. And then you rerun all your analyses to see if anything uh, changes. Oftentimes, those kinds of manipulations get rid of, at the most, 1% or 2% of your data. And if you've ever done response time experiments, you probably are keyed into what I'm talking about. But you still want to look at your error rates to see how they fare, ideally, in the real world, as response time increases, your error rate tends to increase. If you get a really slow response, but the subject hasn't made any mistakes in that condition, that's going to raise some red flags, because what that basically says is their lengthy response time is them simply waiting to, until they're absolutely positively sure of their response. And that often is not what you want with subjects. You want them to respond quickly and accurately. Some experimental setups will uh, alert the subject if they're too fast or too slow. Uh, one of the computer programs I use exactly does that. So if you make a response that humans can't make like 100 milliseconds, nobody uh, for the most part can respond that quickly. A little tone will come up after the trial to warn them, uh, you know, you're too fast. Uh, also, if they're too slow, they'll get a warning sign or a warning tone. Uh, but you want to ensure that any kind of analysis you do, so let's say you run your experiment, you do and you have two conditions, or two factors, so you've all taken statistics, you know that you get two main effects, one interaction with two uh, independent variables, and let's say they're all significant for your response time, which is great, um, but more importantly, you, you've qualified those main effects because your interaction is significant, which is always good. And now you run your error rate analysis and you get one main effect and the other main effect isn't significant and the interaction isn't significant. That's typically a warning sign that you've, uh, you've got some problem with your data. You then go back and realize you have a speed accuracy trade-off. And like I said, speed accuracy trade-offs are problematic. Um, and so there are many things one can do to correct those. You may have to rerun your experiment. You may have to go in and see who's making a lot of mistakes and perhaps replace them. But when we talk about information processing, at least in this course, most of what we're going to talk about going to revolve around those two dependent measures, response time and error rate, and hopefully, and we'll see in some of the papers, because they, they list all the tables, uh, we'll see if, if any of that data is uh, affected by a speed accuracy trade-off. Oftentimes, you don't get that, your data are okay, depending on what method you use to trim the data. And keep in mind, trimming data is not cheating. Um, Sometimes the equipment doesn't work. Sometimes the, su the response box doesn't work. Uh, legitimately, sometimes subjects really aren't paying attention. And you want to try to get rid of that kind of quote unquote messy uh, data. So a lot of what we'll talk about in here will revolve around response time and percent correct. Other uh, methodologies that we'll talk about in here, and it really depends on the
type of study. I mean, not all studies in cognition use reaction time. I mean, recall and recognition are also used extensively. And you can apply the same outlier analysis to recall and recognition. Uh, it actually op operates a little differently here. Um, maybe you've heard of a ceiling or a floor effect. You know, if your task is too easy and everybody's getting it correct, you're not really showing any difference across your different conditions. Likewise, if your task is so difficult that people are making 50, 60, 70, 80 percent errors, um, you run into those issues as well. So um, those are things you just have to keep in mind when we talk about adequate information processing. We will uh, today I'll show you some different models of information processing. We showed you one last week, and code, compare, decide, respond. We will talk a little bit more about that today, but I'll also expose you to some other models that are pretty prominent in cognitive psychology. And I imagine in your specific disciplines, you have various models that you kind of embrace uh, as it were, to support your data, but at the same time you try to disconfirm uh, some of those models and perhaps uh, bring up uh, other kinds of models to uh, adequately uh, represent your data. So we'll talk about information processing. Um, we'll also talk about um, kind of the growth of cognitive psychology. I mean, you can go back to Plato and Aristotle if you like, because they talked about things related to cognitive psychology. Um, we're not going to talk about those two at any great length in here. But the notion of how we process information, uh, what we see, quote unquote, what we process, quote unquote, uh, we can take back at least as far as uh, those two. And a lot of cognitive psychology does have some relevance to philosophy. We're not going to get too much into that, although the first article you read by David Marr is kind of a philosophical uh, 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 explanation of issues in cognitive psych. Uh, but, you know, cognitive psych grew out of I mean, for the most part, it grew out of a lot of stuff that happened in the Second World War. And I'll give you some pretty specific examples, not only in this country, but also in Britain and England and the United Kingdom, call it what you like. Um, a lot of what we know today in psychology has come out of uh, mainly United States laboratories and British laboratories. That doesn't mean... Other countries don't uh, produce stuff, but a lot of the beginnings of cognitive psych grew out of uh, issues prominent in the Second uh, World War. And I'll give you a little bit of history there as well. You know, the growth of the, of the personal computer, the growth of computers in general, had a lot to do with uh, cognitive psychology. We talked last week about the pandemonium model, you know, an, an early, early, early 1959 model of how we process letters. Uh, you wouldn't think we'd need a model to process letters because it's so effortless and easy and done within that magical quarter of a second. Uh, but people way back in the 50s were using or trying to use computer models uh, to model human behavior. And that's still a very popular domain not only in psychology, but you name the discipline, people are using computer models to try to mimic uh, as best they can what an actual human does. So we'll talk a little bit about the growth of cognitive psychology. Uh, at the same time, we'll see how, you know, behaviorism is kind of 
taken a nosedive, if you will. Cognition has kind of been on the upswing. There are various uh, reasons why this has occurred. Some would say it's actually the opposite. Uh, there's more growth in behavioristic views and less growth in cognitive views, information processing views. Uh, that's also related to kind of the growth of cognitive psychology uh, in the 50s and the 60s in particular. People were, you know, not ignoring behaviorism, but wanted, quote unquote, better explanations of behavior. Um, and so the advent of the computer, the advent of what came out of the Second World War, the advent of computer models uh, uh, appearing as early as the 1950s uh, made people kind of wonder, you know, maybe there are better ways to explain a button press or uh, a key press or how we read, how we walk, how we talk, how we do whatever. And so we see kind of a, a growth in more of the cognitive domain. Add on to that our, our fascination with how the brain works. Uh, we still really don't know how the brain works, um, even with all these uh, uh, imaging techniques. Uh, we think we know where short-term memory exists. We think we know where some other process exists, so we've kind of localized it somewhere in the brain. And in those tasks, that part of the brain lights up, as it were. I mean, it really doesn't light up. It just is showing more blood flow to that area, uh, and presumably more blood flow means more oxygen is being delivered to that area, more glucose, and so that's where we think some process is localized to. But even that uh, argument kind of falls flat from time to time, uh, and as I mentioned last week, um, many people still consider cognitive psychology the modern day uh, phrenology, and that may or may not be true. Uh, but it gets to this issue of, you know, we still really don't know a lot about how the brain works. Uh, we seem to think we know where different processes are localized. Uh, and if we get these um, fascinating case studies where part of their brain is destroyed through disease or disorder or what have you, and, you know, they can't do some task, uh, we then make the sometimes incorrect assumption that that particular function must be localized to that part of the brain because that subject, because of, the, of whatever happened to them, can't do that task. And as a lot of imaging studies have shown, that's all, uh, oftentimes not the case. Uh, so that assumption that function leads to localization and localization leads to function is not always true. Mainly true, but not always true. That also sparked interest in uh, this so-called cognitive revolution. And I think last week I mentioned a couple individuals who kind of were responsible for that. In uh, England it was Broadbent's uh, 1958 book in the U.S. Nicer's 1967 book. Um, it's not that people weren't thinking about this stuff until 1958. They certainly were. But it wasn't until the 50s and the 60s that this kind of transition occurred whereby psychologists were less interested in behaviorism and more interested in information processing. And so that's where this kind of shift occurred. That's often referred to as the cognitive revolution. Um, another kind of telling historical entry into this was Noam Chomsky. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, he wrote a book review of Skinner's book that came out in, I think it was 57, 
where Chomsky kind of lambasted Skinner and in turn lambasted uh, uh, behaviorism. That's also kind of seen as one of many um, sparks to this uh, cognitive revolution. I mean, there's some debate about that, but for the most part, those were kind of telling uh, events. And of course, not everybody embraced Broadbent, Nicer, or Chomsky. Um, and to this day, some folks still don't embrace Broadbent, uh, Nicer, or Chomsky. But at least from a cognitive perspective, that's kind of what initiated uh, what we now call cognitive psych. We'll also talk about how uh, cognitive psych is pretty dependent on other fields, obviously philosophy, anthropology, computer science, engineering, linguistics, biology. I mean, you mentioned uh, a subdiscipline and has some relationship to cognitive psychology. So it's not just that cognitive psychology emerged on its own without any help, but it certainly didn't. Do that, and, and to this day, all of those fields are intimately involved in issues of what the mind does, how the brain works. Do non-human species have cognition? There's a whole sub-discipline known as animal cognition, which is basically the application of human cognition to animals, and that is a pretty uh, potent and popular subdiscipline as well. These other areas also relevant, obviously computer science, obviously engineering, uh, all of those uh, relate to issues in information processing. So that's kind of one part of this overview today. Now, as I mentioned, we're not going to get too much into uh, these very old philosophers, but they certainly had something to say about uh, what we now know as information processing. I mean, Plato certainly had some uh, implications there. Aristotle, uh, you know, a, a big proponent of we gather information through our senses. Uh, when I put up Nicer's 67 definition, you'll see how it pretty much uh, overlaps with uh, what Aristotle is talking about. Uh, same with John Locke. You know, we start off with a presumably blank slate, and then things get attached to that. So um, there are issues related to uh, how we process information. Is it innate? Are we born with it? Uh, do we have to learn it? And Virtually every process we talk about in here will have some discussion about whether it's innate or learned. We'll also in here, especially when we talk about uh, little kids and infants, and some of the articles you read have uh, little kids and infants as subjects, uh, and some you know pretty fascinating stuff. Um, that'll get at issues related to critical periods. I'm sure you're all familiar with Genie. Anybody know what I mean when I talk about Genie and language development? One of the articles you read talks about her very sad situation, although it still occurs to this day. Um, Genie was abused and neglected by her dad, and this happened back in the 1970s, uh, abused and neglected by her dad. Uh, her dad thought she was uh, developmentally disabled, and as a result, uh, wouldn't let her out of the house, literally. Uh, he chained her up in the basement for not a period of days or weeks or months, but a period of years, something like 10 or 11 years until she uh, was found. Uh, and the issue there was, you know, she missed all of her critical periods. 
and lots of other things. So would she still be able to learn how to talk or walk or any of those things? And to cut to the chase, as it were, in this particular story, she was able to learn some rudimentary language. Uh, she was able to learn some rudimentary motor skills. Uh, and uh, that was kind of, again, one of these very telling case studies. Uh, we hope that those things don't happen, but invariably you read stories of some little kid is locked up in the basement by their parents, uh, not for a period of 10 years, but that stuff still happens, and one wonders how does that traumatic event impact uh, their information processing. Uh, Jeannie's case is probably the most extreme. At least that's what the experts say. Uh, but she was still able to, again, learn some very rudimentary information processing skills. There was some issue, though, that she was uh, developmentally delayed at birth. Uh, they can't prove that for a fact, but that may have also contributed to some of her uh, um, problems uh, processing information. But that highlights one of these case studies that we'll talk about as well uh, throughout this class. A number of the readings, Jeannie being one of them, but a number of the readings you'll see in the book also highlight these very uh, intriguing case studies. Uh, those also give us a little bit of information about how we process information, because usually in those individuals, uh, the thing that has happened to them is very unique. I mean, we don't see cases of abuse and neglect as dramatic as genies, I mean they get pretty close, uh, but not as dramatic as genies, and again some of the case studies uh, that we'll see in the book and throughout the course are also as dramatic. Um, so that'll also give us some information on how we process information. This uh, notion of whether these uh, internal mental representations are innate or learned, we can also go back to some uh, very famous American psychologists, Watson and Gazelle, uh, who also talked about these uh, issues. Um, but the big issue in information processing is kind of this notion of, are we nothing more than passive reactors? And uh, the, their, uh, Pepper in 1961 talks about different world views. Uh, the more mechanistic view uh, says we are simply passive reactors. We accept information. We act upon it, we don't really do anything with that information. Uh, so that's a very mechanistic view. Uh, think of it as kind of like a formula type view, A plus B plus C. You can't really change out the A or the B or the C. Uh, and that's, you know, for a long time that was kind of the common view that humans didn't really anything with the information that came in. They simply acted upon it, and that was it. And that was a long-held belief in American psychology regarding what is behavior. And over time, and so here again we see the impact of history, people started to realize that, you know, humans are probably more kind of active initiators. The active initiation view is more of an organismic, again, that's one of these three world views. Piaget is a pretty big proponent of this. You know, he can be considered a cognitive psychologist, a cognitive developmental psychologist. Um, Marie Montessori, 
Maybe you've heard of her before. Is also kind of an organismic uh, worldview proponent. But this whole notion of active initiators uh, means that the organism actually does something to this information that they're constantly bombarded with. And I say bombarded because even though you're not really aware of it, you are constantly bombarded with various streams of information. Obviously, as I speak, visual information is a big deal. Auditory information is a big deal. But you're also processing gustatory information. Um, you're processing smell information. You're probably, if I ask you about it, start, we'll start processing uh, how the seat you are sitting in feels. Is it really comfortable? Is it really not very comfortable? Up until that point, you weren't really aware of that information, but that certainly is impinging upon your senses. It's just that you're able to actively inhibit that information, and it's a pretty good thing that you're able to actively inhibit many of these multiple streams of information. If you weren't able to actively inhibit this, and there are uh, populations out there that have trouble inhibiting information, you wouldn't get much done. You would be overwhelmed by the task at hand because all of your senses would be simultaneously activated, which for the most part is true, but you would have a lot of trouble inhibiting those senses that are activated that at this very moment aren't really relevant. The hardness or the softness of the chair you're sitting in is really not a relevant dimension. At least it shouldn't be. The smells or tastes that you're currently experiencing, maybe you're chewing gum or maybe some smell is emanating through the room, aren't really relevant at the moment, unless of course the, the smell is overwhelming, a gas leak or something like that. Humans are pretty good at inhibiting and processing at the same time. So not only are you inhibiting information, you're also paying attention to information at the same time, simultaneously. Call it a dual task. It's a, a basis of our attentional system, and it's a really good thing that you are able to do that. Now, some people do it much better than others. Some people have a lot of trouble dividing their attention, paying attention. Oftentimes, we can trace that back to the very few uh, early stages of information processing where their inhibitory mechanism, for whatever reason, disease, disorder, age, is uh, not working like it used to. So. We go from passive reactors to more active initiators. Piaget said that. You know, Piaget said that a lot of cognitive information processing is the result of trial and error. So you're a little kid playing, and a cat walks by you, and you say to yourself, I think I'll pull the cat's tail to see what happens, and you pull the cat's tail and the cat takes a swipe at you, you probably will learn, or maybe you won't, but hopefully you'll learn from that trial that you don't do that. You're actively exploring the environment, testing out, even at a very young age, even infants hypothesize, and even infants, as we'll see later in the course, engage in hypothesis testing. And for many decades, psychologists thought infants were just things that pooped and ate and didn't really do much else. And it wasn't really until this cognitive revolution that developmental psychologists really embraced this idea that infants do a lot of stuff before their first birthday. Their brains 
obviously are still developing. The first two, three years of life are very important critical periods as far as brain development goes. So even from a very early age, infancy, zero to one year of age, we are actively exploring the environment, actively initiating uh, these explorations, and we do a variety of things. We select, we pay attention to something. You know, mommy's voice is a pretty powerful stimulus to an infant. Or looking at mommy, you know, eye contact is pretty uh, important DV in infants because, you know, they have trouble filling out questionnaires. So you have to look to other dependent measures and use other paradigms like habituation. How long do they look at something? How long do they not look? at something. Those are, you know, powerful dependent measures that get at this idea that they're actively initiating a lot of these processes. So they select, we select, we organize, we modify, we reject. It sounds very similar to that encode, compare, decide, respond model that we've uh, talked about and will continue to talk about. So this kind of, call it a paradigm shift, if you will, occurred when psychologists were looking at the idea of do we simply passively register everything and not react, or do we register things and then do things with that information. Regardless of the sense, audition, vision, taste, touch, smell, uh, whatever the sense happens to be. We're constantly, at least this is the cognitive view, we're constantly processing that information, deciding what to do with that information. Are we going to process it further? Is it relevant at this very moment, or are we going to store it away for later use? All of that happens very quickly. Quarter of a second, half a second, even in infants. And when we get to that part of the uh, book, you'll see that even little infants are capable of doing these very uh, difficult kinds of processes. So these, or this distinction also grew out of what Nicer said. And here is the, uh, here is the definition that Nicer used. Now, Nicer wasn't stupid. I mean, he has in there, and I've highlighted it, the word all. But, you know, Nicer was uh, pretty darn accurate uh, in regards to what we all do with this information. It seems like we do a lot of stuff. I mean, according to Nicer, all processes by which the sensory input is transformed, like right now, I doubt any of you are writing down what I'm saying word by word. Even though it's being tape recorded, we could go back and play the tape and check your notes, and I doubt any of you are writing things down verbatim. You probably have a shorthand that you use, but you're transforming this input. And if we looked at each and every one of your notebooks, and of course I wouldn't do this, but if we were to do that, we'd see differences across everybody. So this notion of individual differences, again, a, a big component of cognition, a big component of information processing. There might be some of you that have very similar writings, and maybe you're, you are using every other word or something like that. But I doubt that even if we compared notebooks across individuals that they would be uh, very similar. So you're transforming this information. You're typically putting it in a form that's beneficial to you. You've been taking notes for decades. You know what works. You know what doesn't work. Maybe you do have kind of a shorthand that you use. I mean, 
You know, we don't need vowels to read. Take any word in the English language, take out all the vowels, and you're still pretty good at comprehension, bumping up against 90, 95% comprehension. That may be a shorthand that you use. You just take out all the vowels. They're redundant. You don't really need them. I mean, you don't want to spell heating that way on, you know, the spelling test, but you don't need all that information. So you transform it, you reduce it, you elaborate it. I mean, many of you have really good imagery. Not everybody has good imagery, but if I were to say, don't think of a giraffe, well, it's too late. You've already thought of a giraffe, and now you've probably conjured up an image of a giraffe. And again, I imagine each and every one of you have a very specific image of a giraffe. I could probe a little deeper, you know, is the giraffe looking left, right, up, down? Is it looking forward to you? What does your image look like? Is it a, a, a tall giraffe, a short giraffe? Does it have spots? Is it yellow? Is it black and white? whatever, but you elaborate it, and oftentimes we use imagery to elaborate information that's coming in. We store it. That's where long-term memory comes in. And the argument there is that long-term memory is infinite talked a little bit about this last week. Everything you've ever been exposed to is in your long-term memory somewhere. The fact that you can't pull it out or recall it is most likely a storage and retrieval problem. Now the other side of that argument is we can't possibly store everything we've ever been exposed to. That just overwhelms the system. But that is one of the debates we'll talk about also in this class. Is long-term memory infinite? Is everything we've ever uh, been exposed to in there? We talked last week about infantile amnesia. There's a, uh, an article you read about that where for most people, the average age of their first memory is about three and a half to four years of age. Yours may be right about there. Some of you may have an earlier memory. Some of you may have a little bit of a later memory. But that also gets at this idea of that pretty much everything we've been exposed to is stored away somewhere. So we store information. We recover it, which is just another name for retrieval, and then we use it somehow. Problems with retrieval, you all, through your lifetimes, I'm sure, have experienced tip of the tongue states. We talked a little bit about this last week as well. You remember everything about a certain person, where they were born, favorite color, favorite food, whatever, but you can't remember their name. And it's a very frustrating uh, phenomenon, these TOTs. But the A, they're normal. And they increase as your age increases. But you eventually remember that information. The name pops into your head, usually at a time when you don't need that information. So it's in there somewhere, but recovering it is problematic. And we'll talk about many reasons why uh, recovering information in long-term memory can be problematic. We'll talk a lot about Loftus and her repressed memory research. And there's, again, a huge debate. Some people saying, you know, uh, that infantile amnesia says that before age four or so, we don't really have a lot of memory. So how can you have a repressed memory from something that happened to you when you were six months of age? You know, that gets into very interesting issues about memory, about uh, the development of memory, uh, the, whether this person is telling the truth 
or not? Are they simply making up a memory that seems to fit? I mean, we do that all the time in cognitive psych. You've all heard of a schema. You've all heard of an inference. You do them all the time. You fill in missing information to make whatever seem plausible. We do it all the time. We're often unaware of it, but we do it pretty much unconsciously. So Nicer says we transform it, reduce it, elaborate it, store it, recover it, and use it. And that's a pretty broad definition. Again, he's got the word all up there. And since the uh, publication of his book some 50 years ago, 49 years ago, uh, that's kind of the basis of cognitive psych and information processing. You can think of this as a stage model. You know, each of those words is a particular stage in this model. As we also mentioned last week, models are also kind of interesting. When we first are learning some process, learning how to read, think back to when you were learning how to read, or learning how to walk, or learning how to talk, or any such activity that you learned as a young child. The model that you probably followed was what we call a discrete stage model. Discrete stage models are fine. But they are also somewhat cumbersome. The discrete stage model says you can't start stage two until you finish stage one. It's like you can't watch TV until you finish your broccoli. It's terrible. But that's how a lot of processes begin. Very discreetly. When you were learning how to read, it was probably a combination of letter by letter. Then you mixed in the sounds or the phonology of the letters. And then you scrunched them all together. And what in turn occurred is this very pretty uh, overlapping stage model. Now, there are problems, obviously, in how I draw these. Not that I'm a terrible drawer, but I'm making an assumption that all those stages or the time between the stages are equal. That's not true. Same is true with that uh, overlapping model. I mean, I have, them, I have them drawn indicating that these are all identical in time and duration. That's not true either. So take it with a grain of salt, or two grains of salt. But that bottom model is now how we do most of our information processing. We can easily start stage two well before stage one finishes. In some cases, we may skip right over it. That example of where you take the vowels out of words. Take a page from, oh, anything. Your thesis, your dissertation, and just take out all the vowels and see if you can still process that information. That's the copy you should give to your committee and see if they can figure it out. It'll baffle them. They won't know what to do. But that's Nicer's definition. Very broad, very compelling, very all-encompassing. But his definition also led to these various models of information processing. 
me show you just a few of these models. Again, keep in mind, we start off at the discrete level. We hopefully end at the overlapping level. I think I mentioned this last week. This will make more sense when we get to the attention chapter. But think of every process you do as falling on this continuum. When you were first learning how to tie your shoes, and you may now think back to that time period, you were starting off or riding a bike or walking or crawling or babbling or talking or doing whatever. Learning SPSS, I don't know, that's probably in here too. You started off at a very controlled level where there's lots of effort. In fact, the amount of effort often overwhelms one when they're first learning a new task. So consequently, many trials are required. borrow a term from the learning literature trials to criteria. You know, how many trials did it take you to learn some task? And across all of you, we'd show pretty robust individual differences. Some learn it quick. Some don't learn it so quick. So the learning curve for some of you is that way. The learning curve for others of you that way. Regardless, you start off at that very controlled, laborious, time-consuming stage. And then with time, with brain development, with practice, these tasks hopefully become automatic. Now we'll talk at length about automaticity in here. We'll see that uh, Many things we do are automatic to the point that we're not even aware that they're automatic. For example, I frequently will put my glasses up here and I'll start doing something and I'll have forgotten I put my glasses up there. Now, I'm not demented or amnesic or anything like that. It's just that I do that a lot and I do it in a very automatic fashion. I don't realize I've done it, and then I get off onto something else, and then I'm now looking for my glasses, and I'm hunting and looking. Did the cat take them? Did my wife hide them? And there they are on top of my head. You've all experienced that kind of phenomenon. Maybe you come home at night, and you have a little bowl on your desk where you throw your keys. But one night you come home, you go through the door, and the fire alarm is ringing, or the phone is ringing, or something is going on, and you automatically throw your keys in there, or you put them somewhere else, and then after this event is over, you're wondering, where are my keys? And you can't find them, you can't find them, you can't find them. So we often kind of vacillate between controlled and automatic processing. I could very easily if I wanted to, and we did this last week as a demonstration, take an automatic process of yours and get it way back down to what it was like when you first did it. And the demonstration I used last week is write your name with your dominant hand like you always do, and now try to write it with your non-dominant hand. And you'll immediately see how quickly a supposed automatic process can revert back to a controlled process. In that situation, it's pretty easy to overcome that. You just go back to your dominant hand. But as we'll see in this course, if you have a stroke that wipes out part of your brain and now has wiped out many of your automatic processes, what are you going to do to get those processes back? You will eventually get them back. Some stroke therapies are pretty good at restoring maybe not to 100%, but say 90%, or if you get a closed head injury, 
Same thing. Many of your automatic processes like eating, walking, talking, speaking, you have to relearn them. And you eventually can relearn them, again, maybe up to about 90%. It depends on the extent of the stroke or the closed head injury. So we'll also delve into those kinds of models as well. And since we've been going for an hour, and I don't want to do the models now and then in two minutes give you a break, I'll just give you a break now, five-minute break, and then we'll pick up on what we're talking about. If you weren't here last week, please make sure your name is on there. That's probably the last time I'll do that, but I just want to make sure you're where you're supposed to be. If you want to be in the class and your name's not on there, come and see me. I will override you in with a little fanfare. folks, let us uh, commence. We were talking about types of uh, models, uh, some discrete, some not discrete. Uh, we were talking about this uh, continuum of uh, controlled processes. Uh, to automatic processes, and that's pretty much uh, the model that we'll be using throughout the semester. But I do want to show you some of the models uh, we'll also be discussing, uh, just letting you see the simplicity of some of them. For example, here is uh, one of the initial models of uh, information processing. Um, very parsimonious kind of model, uh, easy to explain. You know, information comes in. We uh, spend about, oh, milliseconds in sensory memory. Uh, you've heard of iconic memory, where uh, a, an image you may conjure up is gone, you know, relatively quickly. You've probably heard of echoic <coughs> memory. Sometimes you hear a song on the radio or wherever and you just can't get that song out of your head. You think about it all the time. It seems to be playing on a uh, do loop in your brain. That's also related to sensory memory. But sensory memory of all three of those stages is by far the shortest of the three. But obviously you need sensory memory. Uh, we've talked about the uh, importance of it already, and you see the little word attention there next to it. Um, as you're processing information from all of your senses, uh, assuming they all are working uh, to some uh, predetermined level, you're simultaneously, as I mentioned before, inhibiting information, but you're also uh, continuing to process information. That occurs even as early as sensory memory. Now this particular model dates from the 1960s. Uh, again, this model, you see it in every intro psych book, you see it in every cognition book, you probably see it in, in every developmental textbook. It's a very good model. It explains a lot of behavior. Um, but it has some problems with it as well. For example, short-term memory, which up there it says working memory as well, and I'll, I'll give you a working memory model in a minute here, uh, is also part of this three-stage model. Assuming things get into your sensory memory and assuming you process those things, you'll eventually get that stuff into short-term memory, what we now call working memory. But even short-term memory is 
relatively short, no pun intended, uh, and we know that because of uh, Brown, Peterson, and Peterson, who independently showed us that the uh, duration of short-term memory is about, give or take a few seconds, about 20 seconds if you're not able to rehearse. Waugh and Norman updated those two, but even the Waugh and Norman figure shows the same thing at around 18, 19, 20 seconds without rehearsal, information is gone from short-term memory. Now, it's not really gone. I mean, the initial account of Brown, Peterson, and Peterson was kind of like in sensory memory. I have it written backwards. That's not good. That it just decays away. Bits and pieces of the information decay away, never to be seen or heard of ever again. But that's really not the case. Uh, what we now know to be true is that interference is what causes the loss of information in short-term memory. One reason it's interference, as I'll show you in a little bit here, is because of what we actually do in short-term memory. I mean, the Brown, Peterson, and Peterson, and Waugh, and Norman studies were, for their time, quite elegant, but they were also very simplistic. Subjects weren't allowed to uh, rehearse information. Subjects were given kind of distractor tasks to prevent them from rehearsing. If I don't give you a distractor task, your percent recall on that task will be right about 100%. So things really don't decay away. Uh, things get interfered with. Our priorities change of what to process. We store information away rather haphazardly. That's why retrieval is often a problem. Like, who's your first grade teacher? Maybe some of you are still thinking of that. When I asked you a week ago, maybe you figured it out. But you may not have stored that properly. It's in there somewhere. Uh, you have to dig through a lot of information to get to that little bit of information. But as we'll see, we certainly do a lot more in that 20 or so seconds uh, that we call short-term uh, memory, that we now call working memory. And then we have long-term memory, and I've written a little infinity sign here because the argument now is that everything you've ever been exposed to across all of your senses, which is a lot of stuff, is in there somewhere. Now... Pulling it out is a different story. You may have encoded it poorly. Thus, the retrieval cues you try on it will just simply not work. But the argument goes the information is in there somewhere. The reason why your uh, uh, infantile amnesia uh, first memory is around age three and a half to four is based on how children of that age and, and, and uh, younger form retrieval cues, how they form uh, processes to store information. Uh, those don't usually kick in until about three or four just in general, but again, the argument is that information is in there at some level. So this very early, very parsimonious uh, model of information processing um, was uh, uh, quite important. It offered one way to model these behaviors. And you can apply this to pretty much any task that we talk about. Reading, writing, walking, tying your shoe, uh, cooking, anything you, that involves your brain, uh, we can probably explain it this way. It also nicely has this very nebulous concept of attention. Uh, which we'll explore much uh, further when we get to that section of the book. But clearly, attention is required even in sensory memory. You have to have some mechanism to get information into 
short-term or working memory. You have to have some mechanism to get information from short-term and working memory into long-term memory, and then reverse that, pull all that information out. So attention becomes very critical. So too does the response type. Again, you can make responses any number of ways, uh, verbally, auditorily, tactily, pretty much any of the senses uh, can also be used as a response. But that's a very nice model of information processing. We mentioned that uh, what used to be called short-term memory is now called working memory. That's because of uh, Alan Baddeley's work from, uh, this was published in, in uh, 2000, uh, but he was working on it well before uh, the year 2000. Um, but Baddeley is responsible for, and others, I mean, it's not just him, but he was one of the first to show that what happens in that 20 seconds that we call short-term memory goes leaps and bounds beyond what Peterson, Peterson, Brown, Waugh, Norman, whoever was working on uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s. Here's what Baddeley proposed, that each of these different uh, components, as well as the central executive, uh, there are lots of studies out there that support these various components. Now, of course, as we'll see throughout the book, a lot of models are the box and arrow type. Uh, even this one is the box and arrow type. Uh, as I've already told you, those are not the best representations of those models. They'll do for this course or if you use these models in your work, but obviously the boxes can be bigger or smaller. The arrows can be shorter or longer. Uh, but always keep that as an aside when we talk about models. I'll show you one here in a minute where you just kind of wonder what the heck is going on with that model. Um, but as far as working memory goes, Baddeley and colleagues found that lots of stuff happens in working memory. It doesn't happen in sensory memory. That's too short a duration, you know, a second or so, not even a second for some of that. It doesn't happen in long-term memory. It's really... All the fun, exciting stuff happens in working memory. What Baddeley also showed was the implication of the central executive, or as we also refer to the frontal lobe uh, as being kind of uh, uh, what's in charge of uh, working memory. So damage to your frontal lobe, um, be it disease, disorder, uh, closed head injury, whatever, whatever can affect your uh, frontal lobe. Um, damage there is going to have uh, severe repercussions uh, for all of these dis different subcomponents. And in fact, across the information problem model uh, spectrum, Problems at uh, working memory are what cause most of the major uh, problems in information processing. We rarely see problems in sensory or long-term memory. Even in old people, even in demented people. Now, I don't mean to pick on the elderly or the demented, but in those kinds of studies, these components of information processing are usually intact in those individuals. So, we often show no age differences in those two components of information processing. Now, if you ask the man or woman on the street, they're going to say, oh, old people suffer greatly in everything, and old people have really bad sensory memories, and old people have really bad long-term memories. In fact, in some cases, old folks do a lot better than people your age on tasks of long-term memory. Recall of information, things of that sort, old folks just tend to do a lot better because they've been at it longer. They have more uh, information and long-term memory uh, to uh, use 
That also raises other issues for the elderly because they often have trouble retrieving information from long-term memory because of all the interference that's going on. And as you age, your frontal lobe declines anyway, just normally. Um, that's why a lot of old people have trouble inhibiting information. They'll tell you something you don't really want to hear. They'll just let it all come out. They have trouble inhibiting those kinds of in, uh, pieces of information. That's because their frontal lobe is starting to show decline. That's not a marker of, getting, uh, of being demented or anything. That's a normal everyday process where your frontal lobe declines with age. But working memory really encompasses a lot of information, much more than the Waugh, Norman, Brown, Peterson types of tasks. And what Baddeley found is, and he has evidence for each of these components, that in working memory we do have this visual spatial sketch pad uh, that he calls, where we're actually processing visual spatial information. If you have problems with spatial ability, like if I have you draw a map from here to somewhere else, or I have you, instead of drawing a map, I have you write out sentences that uh, are similar to that map. You turn left, you turn right, you go this way a mile. Uh, if you have troubles with spatial ability, you're going to have troubles with visual spatial sketch pad abilities. He also showed evidence for what he called an episodic buffer. You've all, if you've taken a class like this, heard of episodic memory. Think of it like an episode of a TV show, very specific kind of memory, but also relevant to um, the central or uh, the working memory is this episodic buffer. What do you keep in your episodic buffer for a particular event, an event you're currently working on? Remember, this only lasts about 20 seconds. Now, since we're often dealing with quarters of a second, 20 seconds is an eternity in cognitive psychology. If you have a response that takes 20 seconds, whew, that's a long time, uh, relatively speaking. Um, he also found evidence for the impact of sound or phonology in short-term and working memory. So we're often engaged in tasks that relate to how things sound. And he relates these two to other components. Uh, and then the central executive or the frontal lobe is what controls all of these different mechanisms. Now, damage to your frontal lobe. And there are lots of ways to damage your frontal lobe, disease, disorder, um, any number of different ways. Well, pretty much shut down information processing. In fact, when we go back to these age differences, this is where we often find them. Working memory is where we often find age differences favoring young adults. What does that mean? It means that young adults do better than older adults. On a variety of tasks that tap into working memory. Working memory is also related to intelligence, not surprisingly. Working memory is also related to attention, not surprisingly. And although some aspects of intelligence increase with age, crystallized intelligence, other aspects of intelligence decrease with age, fluid intelligence, for example. Attention also declines with age. If you're an older adult and you have to divide or allocate or focus or pay attention, there's any number of manifestations of that, older folks tend to have more difficulties than younger folks. A lot of those difficulties are because as we age, the frontal lobe starts to decline normally. We have to recruit other processes 
to assist us in these uh, working memory tasks and often the process we recruit is this nebulous concept of attention, which also declines with age. So it's no wonder that most of the information processing deficits, at least as a function of age, occur in working memory. So we now take this previous model and we kind of take this stage out, as it were, and we can now replace it with uh, this stage. Now as we progress through the course, we will tie other stages to brain parts. Uh, again, the frontal lobe is pretty well defined in uh, working memory, but as we'll see, and as a result of a lot of imaging studies, and again, getting at this issue of localization of function and functional localization, uh, we will start to tie brain parts to various processes. Most of those studies will be these various case studies, where an individual or a group of individuals, usually it's just one individual, show some very dramatic uh, responses based on some problem with some part of their brain, and cognitive psychologists in that case tend to then work backwards and say things like, well, if you have damage at part A of your brain and you can't do task B, then part A must be what controls part B. That's kind of circular faulty logic in some instances. We'll talk more about that when we get to those chapters, but that's how that all kind of plays out. So here's what we now know to be working memory or short-term memory. Sensory memory and long-term memory really haven't changed too much uh, over time, not as much as uh, working me or short-term memory has. Here's another model we talked about, brought up by Sternberg. Now, he used his model to talk about short-term memory, because back in 1969, people were still talking about short-term memory. The concept of uh, working memory hadn't really uh, been put forward at that point. And even though Sternberg was talking about how we scan our short-term memories, three ways to scan it, parallel, serial exhaustive, serial self-terminating. He brought up this, again, very parsimonious kind of model. You encode something, you compare it to something else, you make a decision, it's usually yes or no, up, down, left, right, whatever the decision. It's usually a binary, two-choice kind of decision. You can make it really difficult to have a three and four-choice decision. That doesn't really change the model. Uh, it just makes you a lot slower and more uh, error-prone. And then you execute a motor response. Usually it's a button press. It could be a foot press. There are some studies out there where they have people use their feet rather than their hands. It could be a motor a vocal response. It could even be an eye movement response, uh, especially when you're dealing with uh, uh, little kids or uh, like in the habituation paradigm. You can't have them press buttons. They can't do that yet, but you can certainly monitor their eyes. You know, do they shift their eyes to a certain location? You can use eye movements as a, uh, a motor response. But again, a very parsimonious model Again, the box and arrow uh, uh, issue, and as we said last week, there are problems with these kind of models because for some people, the encoding phase might take a really long time. Others, it might not take a long time. Uh, the decision component, especially if you have troubles making decisions, even a two-choice decision, yes, no, up, down, right, left, that can be problematic for some individuals. 
and then uh, a simple motor response. Voice, press a button, use your foot, whatever the, the motor response happens to be. Even though uh, Sternberg used this model to talk about short-term memory, you can apply this to virtually every cognitive process that we talk about in this class. It doesn't have to be short-term memory. It can be retrieval from long-term memory. It can be decision-making. It can be problem-solving. It can be anything that we talk about. And that's what's nice about that particular model. It explains a lot, which you want your models to do. But we also know in science that for every model we see or use, we want to disprove it at some level and trot out another better model that will explain more of the behavior. And that's just how science operates. But that's a pretty good model. Still in use, all the tasks that you folks do, all the different areas that you folks study, you could easily, I imagine, uh, apply this model to it and uh, you could explain some particular behavior. So up until now we had some pretty easy models and here we get into a model of, believe it or not, how to read. This was um, by theorists by the name of Mo uh, McClellan and Rummel Hart. Uh, they are psychologists, but they were also interested in using computers to model behavior. So this is a, a, a model from a paper they published in it's either Psych Bulletin or Psych Review, you know, the top journals in psychology, way back in 1981. That's a long time ago. Um, but what they were interested in was, again, this idea of interactive activation. Now, that sounds like a foreign language, perhaps, but think back to what I talked about a little earlier. When you're processing information, you're simultaneously activating stuff and simultaneously inhibiting stuff. Remember, it's an overlapping model. It's not a discrete model. So as I'm talking to you now, you're activating certain components of what is he saying? What should I write down? But at the same time, you're presumably inhibiting other kinds of processes. And you do this very quickly and very easily. It's an automatic process. You do it all the time. You're just usually not aware that you're doing it. Now, if I made you aware that you're doing it, um, for example, I could have you be taking notes, but at the same time, I might have you vocalize something. Uh, your initial task would start to suffer. So when you start to think about automatic processes, they often go back down on that continuum. They become more difficult. And they've done these kind of interesting studies whereby they have you, while you're walking down a flight of stairs, and of course they, they take all the necessary control so when you, you fall you don't break your leg or hit your head. But while you're walking down a flight of stairs, for everyone it's a very automatic process. We can do all sorts of other things while we walk up or down a flight of stairs. But if I now have you do something else while you're walking up or down that flight of stairs, that takes this automatic process and pushes it back to a very demanding, very controlled kind of process and people actually do much worse. They actually fall down the flight of stairs uh, because they're now uh, a previously automatic process is now competing with some other type of process. We see the same phenomenon in those individuals who despite the published literature drive while they're talking on their cell phone now, or text. 
uh, while they're talking on their cell phone. All of you are expert drivers. How do I know that? I'm just making a guess. I'm not going to call the DMV and find out. But I'm assuming you're all pretty good drivers. And as you drive, and I don't know how many of you talk on the cell phone or text or eat or comb your hair or get dressed or do what else these things that a lot of people do when they're driving their car. I'll assume that up to a point, your driving ability is pretty good. But as I start adding more and more tasks, your performance starts to get worse and worse and worse. So for many of us, we kind of asymptote. Your performance doesn't get any better or any worse. But if I now start piling on tasks, you don't see that black ice up ahead. You don't notice that ball coming across from out between two cars. You don't see that snow plow or whatever. And you're doing these other tasks. This presumably automatic process will start to suffer. And you might get in an accident. You might have to slow down. You might do all sorts of other things. But it relates to this idea of simultaneous activation but simultaneous inhibition. Rummelhart and McClelland have a very simplistic model of, and they use this to indicate or say uh, how people learn to read, how little kids learn to read. They modeled this via computer, so they had a computer model they developed to uh, go through this process. They compared it to human data so they got data from little kids learning how to read. And the models overlap pretty well, which is actually very good when you computer model something. And it's very similar to the actual human process you're modeling. That says your model is actually doing a pretty good job of modeling this very uh, intricate human behavior, learning how to read, for example. But they have various levels, much like the models we've already talked about. In other words, when you're learning how to read, and we're not even taking into account the auditory information that helps you learn to read, but when you're learning how to read, there's a lot of visual information. A lot of it is lines and angles and curves and all that sort of stuff. So, for example, when I say, is that an A? Is that an A? Is that an A? They're all A's. And over time, you've taken in all those various features. You've come up with a template, for example, uh, that, that highlights the critical features. You ignore the irrelevant features, and you're able to identify all of those kind of squiggles as the letter A. They did the same thing. So visual input comes in. You're reading uh, information on a page. You're getting various activation for certain features. But at the same time, you're inhibiting other features. So while you're reading, and it's a good thing that you're able to do those at the same time. Now, when you first learned how to read, it was very problematic. You probably got stuck on letters. You probably couldn't sound out certain letters. And although they don't talk about auditory information, that's very critical when you're learning how to visually uh, process information. But you had problems with this simultaneous activation and inhibition. And doing two things at the same time is actually a highly important skill. Many of you can do three things at the same time. I'm sure many of you drive your car. You're talking on the cell phone. You might be texting. You might be listening to the radio. There might be other people in the car that you're listening to. You're looking at all the pretty uh, scenery. You're doing all sorts of stuff at the same time. But it's because you're able to actively, or you're, you're able to activate and inhibit at the same time. Well, they say that visual input, uh, which goes through this activation and inhibition process, leads to a feature level. So now with these very kind of unknown features, we're able to start constructing very rudimentary letters. And from the feature level, we go to the letter level. And then to the letter level, we go to the word 
level. So now when we're trying to figure out what these words are, we see A in the first position, N in the second position. Those are all four letter words. We're actively inhibiting and activating information at the same time. And we eventually arrive at the conclusion that the word might be able or trap or trip or take or time or cart or whatever the word happens to be. So this interactive activation model, again, a very good model of information processing says in something as simplistic as word identification, which we've said takes a quarter of a second at most, at least in good readers, poor readers it's a little bit longer. But once you're a good reader, this process, four stages, uh, takes about a quarter of a second. Now, what stage takes the most is debatable. We can do experiments where we can figure out the duration of each stage, because obviously the, the duration is not the same. Um, over time and with practice, as I mentioned, you don't need all the vowels to identify words. Um, but again, a very intriguing kind of model that highlights, again, a very basic information processing task, activating information while at the same time inhibiting other information. So those are some models to think about. And so now just to kind of give you an overview of what we've talked about today, and then I'm, I'm going to go back to that uh, test that we talked about last week, just to kind of summarize what we've talked about today. The big issue in information processing is the time period from about the 40s to about the 60s. So again, we see the relevance of the Second World War, and I'll show you some examples of what kind of grew out of the Second World War. Um, impact of information happening in the 40s and the 50s. Computers were starting to be developed. Uh, information from the Second World War was now applied to everyday activities. We have the publication of Nicer's book, and to some extent the publication of uh, Broadbent's book as well. And then this shift from uh, behaviorism to information processing. We can now define what cognitive psychology is. But we can add a whole lot more. All of those terms up there are related to information processing. And your book is laid out pretty much from the very basics of pattern recognition, where you take raw sensory information, and over time you tap into conceptual or high level information, and cognition is what happens kind of in the middle. Now that little model over there is, again, a very prominent model that we'll come back to in here. Top down, bottom up. It has nothing to do with drinking in a convertible, so don't mix those concepts up. Bottom up is any raw sensory information from all of your senses. Not just vision, not just hearing. Those are the more popular senses, the ones you rely on the most, but don't neglect your other senses. And then over time, these processes interact such that you now tap into higher order information, decision making, problem solving, language, if you will, comprehension. 
And then the mixing of the two is what we call cognition. So all of those plus Nicer's definition will be things we talk about. Pattern recognition, listening, seeing, touching, attention, memory, problem solving, decision making, comprehension, reading, you name it, we can encompass it, not only in Nicer's definition, but uh, with these different models that we've talked about. We'll see that some of these processes are very simple. You don't need a lot of practice. Others are very demanding, where you have to practice and practice and practice and practice. We'll again go back to that continuum, controlled, automatic, but these are the basics of what we're going to be talking about in here. How do we study cognition? I do it with a computer and a very specific methodology, response time. I do from time to time, though, do studies where I have people fill out questionnaires and other measures, and I correlate those measures, and I try to make some substance out of that. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, I study cognition at its most basic level, and that's using response time. So for the work I do, if you ever take more than a second to do something, a lot of red flags go up for me, because more than a second to process a word, to make a decision, that's a problem. For you, it might be very different. I don't know how many of you use response time. Actually, I'll ask, how many of you use response time in the studies that you do? I see a couple hands going up. Okay. So how do we study cognition? Well, there's lots and lots and lots of ways to study it. You can study it at the very raw sensory level, like response time, or you can study it at a much higher conceptual level. You have subjects read a vignette, and you ask questions about how they comprehended the vignette, or you change one specific word in the vignette. You take men and you replace it with woman, or women, or man, or whatever. And you see how that uh, impacts how they process information. So how you study cognition is probably very different than how I study cognition. But last week I showed you some examples of cognitive articles that kind of encompass all of what all of you do. Some of you might be at the very lowest levels, raw sensory. Others of you might be at the highest levels. You manipulate one word, one phrase, one sentence, one picture, one sound, one whatever, and you see how that influences uh, people's behavior. So you can study cognition at any of a number of levels. But it raises the question of how do you study something you can't see? And this has always been the big argument of behaviorists. If you can't see it, it doesn't exist. Well, maybe. If that's true, how do you explain reaction time difference? That's always the question I ask people. If you have two conditions, that tap into these very nebulous internal mental representations, like a script, you all use a script or scripts on a daily basis. How do, uh, what do you do when you go to a restaurant? What do you do when you go to a concert? What do you do when you go to a lecture? What do you do when you go to whatever? You tap into a script ahead of time, or at the time, and you figure out, is this matching what it's supposed to match? Does this event match what I've stored away in my internal mental representation? But how do you study those? What's the best methodology to study them? If you're really interested in what happens in that first second of processing, then you'd probably want to use response time. 
Because anything after a second, there's too much other stuff going on that could be implicated. If you're interested in how uh, responses differ based on the, the changing of one word, or a title, or a picture, then you're way farther up the chain, as it were. But you're still studying this internal mental representation. These are kind of tricky. You've all heard of repressed memories. And even so-called false memories. And even that infantile amnesia experiment. You know, those are all internal mental representations. But if you tell me I can remember my first birthday, I wouldn't laugh in your face, but I'd say, how do you know that's what happened to you? Did somebody record it? Well, maybe they did. Somebody take pictures? Well, maybe they did. And you've looked at that recording and those pictures, and now you know what happened, and you can tell everybody, here's what happened at my first birthday. But how do you really know? Let's say you didn't record it, or you didn't write it down or take a picture of it. How do you know it actually happened? That's why in a lot of studies that rely on memory, researchers will often ask, okay, what's your confidence level? How confident are you of that, that you remember? How many remember your birth? Anybody here remember their birth? Of course not. Maybe you do. How confident are you of it? Oh, I'm 100% sure. There were all these people, and there were all these lights. Well, all one needs to do is tap into a schema, fill in what you didn't observe, and there you go. Now you've remembered that particular event. So knowing what an internal mental event is one thing, how to study it is a totally different kind of thing. Now, this issue of verifying an internal mental event, for the most part, isn't a big deal. Did you have a chocolate cake at your birthday or white cake at your birthday? Not a big deal. But when it gets into issues like repressed memories, and when it gets into issues of false memories, and even when it gets into issues of infantile amnesia, then it becomes more controversial, and as a result, at least for me, more interesting. So, how do you go about studying it? Do you rely on introspection? You know, introspection, even though it's this kind of, some would say, hocus-pocus kind of methodology, is used extensively in current-day cognitive psychology. If you ask subjects to tell you what they're doing, at a given moment, it's often called protocol analysis. You verbalize what you're doing. And maybe some of you have used protocol analysis to kind of get in the minds, literally, of what your subjects are thinking. That's great, but again, how do you verify that that's really what's going on. That'll be the thing we come back to time and time and time and time again in this class is how do we know what's really happening in people's responses or if they're recalling a memory from a long time ago or what have you. How do you, how do you verify that that's actually happening? We'll talk about ways to do that but that becomes a central issue, especially if your whole line of research rests on something like introspection, or recall, or recognition, or phrenology. Now, phrenology uh, is not used anymore, although you know, there were phrenology journals about 100 years ago, actual real journals that people published in. And as I've said, 
many consider modern day cognitive psych to be the new phrenology. You know, we put somebody in the PET scanner, we put them in the MRI, and we get these really nice pictures, and we have them do stuff while they're in the PET scanner and the MRI, and now we can uh, uh, connect point A to behavior B, and we can say without a shadow of a doubt that this part of the brain controls this process until we find out in a case study or another person that that same or very similar part of the brain has nothing to do with that particular process. So we'll kind of go back and forth throughout the semester talking about, you know, is modern day cognitive psych just a rehashing of phrenology? I don't think so, but there are those out there that certainly say yes, that's exactly what modern day cognitive psych is. Even with all the fancy equipment, all the fancy imaging techniques, we still really don't know how the brain works. We think we did. Back in the 1990s, they called it the decade of the brain. We're going to learn everything about the brain in these 10 years, and that'll be it. Didn't happen. We still really don't know how the brain works. We're close, but we still don't. And also, what about subjective experience? You know, subjective experience is fine. You know, the so-called sixth sense. How do you know that's nothing more than you're just very biased? That happens a lot, too, when we make decisions, how we make decisions. Humans are terrible at making decisions, be it what am I going to wear today, to who am I going to marry, to what car am I going to buy, to you name the decision, humans are really bad at it. And it's nothing against any of you. It's just that we're bad at making decisions. Even when we have a lot of information, we still make terrible decisions. Bias creeps in all the time. Even though it's at a level that we often say is quote unquote unconscious. We're not aware that I was biased against that person until you take a test. What's it called? IAT? The IAT is a test of reaction time that gets at your bias. And you might say, oh, I'm not biased. I like everybody. Until you take this test and you find out, gee, you're really biased against this group and that group and this group and that group. How can I be? I'm not biased. Well, maybe you are, maybe you aren't. It gets at this issue of it might be at a level that you're not aware of. And again, some would say that's kind of the hocus pocus of all this stuff. But we're often aware of stuff that we're not really conscious of. And we make decisions Nonetheless, so subject experience, subjective experience used a lot in cognitive psych, a lot of issues surrounding it as well. Oops. These various models, as I mentioned, they're great. They prov provide a nice foundation for whatever any of you do research-wise, but you have to be able to disprove them. Where do they fail? That's the really intriguing part, uh, not for the people who come up with the model, because they like their models and they think their models are better than anybody else's model, but if you really want to make an impact, disprove a model. Show where the model doesn't work and people will like you. Not everybody, but many people will like you. So know the models, but know how to disprove them. That's important. Don't just believe in a model because it's pretty or anything like that. In here, we're going to talk a lot about thresholds. You know, does information meet or exceed a specific threshold? And if it does, what do you do then? You know, the Simplicit Association Test, or the IAT, 
which is very popular. It's like the hula hoop of uh, cognitive psychology. Everybody is doing the inner or the, uh, the IAT test, and it's showing some very interesting results. That a lot of times we're totally unaware of biases we hold, be it against a certain group, be it against a certain person, be it against whatever, we actually show a lot of these biases and we're just simply not aware of them. And it's not that we're actively uh, inhibiting them, we're just not aware that we hold those particular biases. Now, of course, like every methodology, there are problems with the uh, implicit association test. People have written about the problems with it. But it's a very powerful tool to get at this issue of when are we aware of stuff happening and when are we really not aware of stuff happening. So we'll talk about uh, perceptual reality in here. You know, can people process information when they're unconscious? And you might say, well, no, they can't. But, in fact, here's a study done kind of a while ago, 20 years ago. So the doctors better be careful what they say about you when you're laid out on the operating table under general anesthesia. Because this study showed, and some have showed it since, that we're able to process information even when we're unconscious. So watch what you say to people. But it gets at this issue of perceptual reality. Where do we set our thresholds for processing information? At what point in the processing sequence, you know, it's, it's always moving forward, time is always moving forward. At what point in the processing sequence do we stop and take notice of, hey, wait a minute, I'm doing something I really shouldn't be doing, or I'm thinking of something I really shouldn't be thinking of. Where do we set our particular thresholds? Some people have very short thresholds. Others, a lot of stuff can happen before their threshold generating mechanism will kick in. When is perception reality? We I mean, will talk a little bit about consciousness in here. That's a whole area of study in cognitive psychology. You present information below somebody's threshold. Here's their threshold. But yet they're still able to process it. You're under general anesthesia, but yet you're processing what's going on around you. How can that happen? Hocus pocus, maybe. But it gets at this issue. When is perception reality. You see a mirage. You're driving down the highway and you look ahead. It's a sunny day and the road, you see all these squiggly lines and the road looks like it's kind of like a pool of water. It's not a pool of water at all. And you're not on any kind of really bad drug. What's going on there? How do you know that the road is not turned into water? We talked about the Second World War, a lot of stuff coming out of there. Signal detection was one such mechanism. You all know the signal detection paradigm. A uh, signal is present, you either detect it or you don't. If the signal's present and you don't detect it, that's a problem. Or if the signal's not present and you detect it, that's a problem as well. That was a big problem for aviators in the Second World War because they were processing multiple streams of information and they had to decide, did I see that target or did I not see that target? If I saw the target, or where is the target, do I drop a bomb on that target? Well, you better be really sure that you got the right target. Because if you don't have the right target, that's a problem. That happens time and time and time again. We think we see a target or hear a target or taste a target or touch a target, and we don't. And we make a mistake. We drop the bomb or do whatever. That kind of is another issue in information processing.
Are you detecting the signals? And then, of course, are you biased? I mean, I'm assuming none of you are, but certainly your previous experience weighs heavily on the decisions you make. Even though flying is the safest form of transportation, it's much safer than driving. After 9-11 and after any plane crash, people say flying is really unsafe. I'm never going to fly again. What do they base that on? Oftentimes it's an unfounded conclusion. Expectation also affects our performance. That's where schemas come in. If you have a restaurant schema, and you're going out to dinner with your friends, you have certain expectations that need to be met, otherwise something's not right here. So you go in the restaurant, and you sit down, and the waiter or waitress takes 30 minutes before you get some water and some bread. You might say, something's going on here. They're either really busy, or the waiter and waitress have really bad memory, or I didn't shower, or something but my expectations aren't met. These two can often lead to that, and you're totally unaware that that's occurring. I'm going to give you a break here in a minute, I promise. Another couple minutes, and then I'll give you a break. Um, still in the methods component, what type of memory? These are just types of memory that we're going to look at in this course. Not just sensory, short-term, long-term. Autobiographical memory, semantic memory, procedural memory, all localized to certain brain parts, by the way. And there are case studies that support and refute each of those brain parts. But the study of memory goes well beyond what we often think of as memory, short-term, long-term uh, working memory. So we'll talk about different kinds of memories. We'll talk about how those memories can kind of melt together at some point. We'll talk about how we can have problems retrieving different kinds of memories. You know, what happened at your 10th birthday, 20th birthday, 30th birthday. Uh, procedural memory, a form of unconscious memory. Procedural memory is related to implicit memory. So you learn some task, but you have no idea of how you learned it. There are uh, methodologies out there that test your ability at procedural memory, but procedural memory is very intriguing. How did you learn that task? How did you learn how to ride a bike or tie your shoes? You really don't know. It just kind of happened one day. I mean, that's the hocus pocus explanation of it, but it often happens at a level where you're not really consciously aware of it. Yeah, why don't you take another break, folks, and then we'll, uh, five minutes, and then we'll do a little bit more of the questions, then I'll let you go. We talked about today, or what's required for next week, because next week is when we really start getting into it. Uh, please let me know. <laughs>